Welcome PCS members and friends to our today's uh, IBS PCS seminar. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have with us today Professor Tomoki Ozawa from Tohoku University. And I would like to invite our scientific host, Alexei, to introduce our speaker. Please, Alexei. Yeah, thanks, students. So, yeah, welcome everyone again. So, our today's speaker is Professor Tomoki Ozawa from Tohoku University, and he will be talking about physical and mathematical relations between quantum metric and topology of chart insulators. So, let me uh, briefly introduce the speaker. So, Professor Ozawa received his PhD in 2012 from uh, at University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and then was a uh, postdoctoral researcher at University of Trento and Uni Free University of Bruxelles in Belgium. Um, after that, he moved uh, to uh, Riken, where he was a, post um, a senior research scientist. And since 2020, he is an associate professor and junior principal investigator uh, at the Tohoku uh, University, Japan. And um, in, the, in parallel, he was also associated, he was also a Presto researcher at Japan Science and Technology Agency. And so with this, um, let's welcome our speaker and uh, please, Tomoki, the screen is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexei, for the very kind introduction. And thank you very much for, for the invitation to, to IBS. I'm, I, let me first uh, share my screen. Yes, OK. OK, thank you again, everyone. So uh, I'm sorry that I cannot physically visit uh, Dejan. And it, it's still uh, a bit difficult for, for me to travel around because of the pandemic situation. Uh, but I, I hope, well, some in the near future, I can physically visit there and interact with you, with you physically. Yes. OK, so, so today I want to uh, present some of my recent work and on physical and mathematical relations between quantum metric and topology of turn insulators. And, but uh, before uh, entering some uh, physics and mathematics, let me first, uh, yes, tell you that I'm very excited to be here because, okay, so this is a website of Center for Theoretical Physics of Complex Systems in IBS, and this is a seminar seminar, uh, it is a top page of the seminar uh, page, I think. And I, I find myself here, it's actually me here, uh, listening to some talk here. I think this photo was taken uh, three or four years ago when I visited uh, IBS for, for a conference. And I'm very glad that the photo is, is used there and I'm very, I'm very uh, amused to find myself. Okay, so uh, let me come back to the science. So, okay, so here's the outline of my talk today. And oh, uh, I, I forgot to say, but please interrupt me at any time if you have questions and, and yes, and that will make uh, our interaction easier. So, so here's the outline. And, and my talk today is mainly or are hardly about quantum metric. And I first explain what this quantum metric is. And then uh, the second part, I explain some of the relations we found between quantum metric and topology. And by topology, I mainly mean churn, uh, churn, uh, churn number, churn insulator topology. And in the third part, I explain some relations we found uh, between these quantum metric and topology and also to the Kähler geometry, which is a geometry, a complex geometry. That is, you put some complex coordinate to, to your, your manifold. And I explain what I mean by that uh, later. But let me start from the uh, introduction. So what is this quantum metric? So, so quantum metric is a, a geometrical property of quantum states. And let me be first be quite general. So I consider a situation where the Hamiltonian H depends on a set of parameters, which I call lambda. Lambda uh, can take several, uh, several uh, components in size, so lambda one, lambda two, and so on. The parameter lambda can, for example, be an external magnetic field, or, or a momentum, which is most relevant in the churn insulator case. But okay, let's say we have some Hamiltonian, which depends on a set of parameters, the set of external, let's say external parameters. And then for a given value of this parameter, energy eigenvalues and energy eigenstates are determined by well, eigenvalue equation. And, and this eigenvalue E n of lambda, where n is the so-called band index, uh, tells you the energy band structure. So, for example, uh, in a plane of lambda one, in a parameter 
sorry, in the space of parameter, you plot this energy eigenvalue and you get this sheet of energy, energy bands. This is energy band structure. And so, uh, which is which is uh, which is important. But what I'm more interested in this talk is eigenvector part, eigenvector which I call psi n of lambda. And so eigenvectors are vectors. That means, for example, let's take two dimensional space lambda and lambda two. Let's say on this point, this eigenvector for for a certain value of uh, n points in this direction. It's it's a schematic drawing. And let's say on this point, this uh, vector points in this direction. It's a vector and vector has some orientation or, or the direction. And that means, so if you want to move this, uh, if you want to move from this point, this point continuously, this arrow should somehow continuously vary from in this direction to this direction. And how this state, the eigenstate changes as one moves in the parameters, parameter space, gives the geometrical properties of the state in the parameter space. And that's what we are interested in. And one very important example of the geometrical property is a curvature. And to understand how curved these states are in the parameter space, we can consider its curvature. And, and in the physics of turn insulator, what's most relevant is the Berry curvature. And let me, let me give you the example, uh, a definition. So we first define Berry connection, which is constructed from a derivative of these quantum states in certain direction in the parameter space. And then from this connection, we can construct the curvature by taking exterior derivative. And so uh, more concretely, the bare curvature in let's say lambda one, lambda j plane can be expressed in this form. So, so what, what it contains is the, the derivative of this quantum states in two direction. And I'm taking, uh, so uh, I'm subtracting one from the other by exchanging i and j. So this quantity is a Berry curvature in, in this plane. And you can show that this is invariant under the gaze transformation that is, this quantity does, does not change if you multiply the quantum state by uh, overall phase factor. Yes, please. Yeah, I think someone has a question. Uh, yes, Dominic, please. Yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm looking at this and I've heard of Berry curvature before, but uh... I was wondering, is there some uh, connection with Fidelity's accessibility? It, uh, it looks very similar and uh, also quantum feature information, actually. Oh, quantum feature information, you said. Uh, yes, the, I will come back to that point later. So yes, it is, it is related. Actually, it's quantum feature information, my, my understanding is more related to quantum metric, which is the main topic of my talk. And quantum metric, I think, uh, is I think essentially a quantum feature information for pure state, so th they are related. Is mm. it so on pure state, the very very curvature is the same as quantum feature information? Uh, no, sorry, so not not very curvature, but the quantum metric, which is uh, which I have not defined, but uh, I'll come back to it so very soon. Yes, but yes, yes, they are related. You're right. Uh, is the Berry curvature related to that or not? I don't, I don't think so. Uh, I'll, I'll show the definition of quantum metric in the next slide. So maybe you can, you can look at the definition and see if you can. Okay. Yes. Okay, thanks. But, but thank you. That's a very important uh, remark. Yes, it, it, there is some connection and between this quantum fission information, which is perhaps relevant in the quantum metrology and also this geometrical quantity. So, uh, but okay, so let me finish this slides before going to the quantum metrics. So, very curvature, uh, physically, what it means is very curvature acts like a magnetic field in a parameter space. And what's important is you integrate this very curvature over two dimensional compact par parameter space, gives you an integer. And this integer is called a churn number, and that is related, uh, that is very important in the context of. Uh, topological insulator. Uh, yes, uh, I think Dario Loza has a question. Yeah, a simple question. In, in case uh, your uh, parameter space is more than two dimensional, uh, how uh -huh. you define this integral? I mean, because. Uh, uh, I this mean, integral here. Yes. In uh, that yes, case, uh. suppose that the parameter space is uh, four dimensional and so on. So, how. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, so, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. So, 
you can uh, construct something analogous in even dimensional space. So in a three dimensional space, this doesn't really work, but for example, in four dimension, it works. And for each uh, even dimension, you have different topological environment. So what I defined here is uh, more uh, precisely speaking, what is called the first turn number. And first turn number is this integral. And in four dimensions, you can define a second turn number, which mm -hmm. can be uh, obtained by integrating uh, the square of that, the, the, the exterior product of the omega with inside, with its side. Yes, it's square, square of that, yes. Omega okay. squared, yes, you're right. Okay, good. Mm. Thank you, thank you very much, yes. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm, I'm very uh, happy to have questions. It's, it's really nice to have questions. So, okay, so now I'm going to uh, define the quantum metric, which is the main topic of my talk today. So not only curvature, we can also introduce uh, the distance in the parameter space from the structure of the quantum state. And so distance, uh, so what I want to do is to find the distance between one, po one point in the parameter space and a nearby point in the parameter space. And that's uh, defined uh, through the so-called metric. So me metric defines the distance in the parameter space. And so, but that's okay, how do I introduce distance? And to introduce distance, I compare two, two nearby quantum states, psi lambda and psi and lambda prime. And I say that these, uh, these two points are close when these two states are similar. And I see that these two points are far when these two points are very different. That is, so I, so I say similar and very different, but what I mean is I take the inner product of these two nearby states. And if, if I say that this inner product is small, I say that the distance is small. If this inner product is large, I say that the distance is large and more, more, uh, so more, let's say, uh, correctly speaking, I consider this uh, line element, that this uh, matrix through this relation. So I take one minus uh, in the product of two, two nearby states squared. That means if this inner product is close to one, that means these two states are uh, similar, the distance is close to zero. And if, if this inner product is very close to zero, the distance is far. And I take, I, let's say I uh, expand this in terms of d lambda and I, and I, you can show that the first order term is zero and the second order term defines the so-called metric. So metric defines the distance in the parameter space. And I can explicitly calculate it by okay, Taylor expanding the states. And so at the, looking at the second order, you get this uh, structure here and this is a quantum metric. And, and in response to Dominic's question, uh, so this quantity, as far as I understand, is, yes, uh, relate is equal to, or maybe uh, there's some factor of two or, or so different, but uh, proportional to the quantum feature information for the state psi n. Okay, yes. And so this is how I introduce metric in a, in a parameter space through quantum states. And Sorry, we can just, another, yes. Another, another question, can you go back? Uh, oh, yes, sir. When lambda, just to be sure, when lambda and lambda prime are very different, uh, how do mm -hmm. you determine the ordering in N? Uh, you say that N is like the third excited states, etc. You order according to the energy, right? To determine which state evolve into another, uh, I mean, when yes, I, I, yeah. yes, I'm looking at the particular band. So I, I fix, I always fix N, the band index, and I'm looking okay. at. Okay, good, good. good. In, inside this particular band, yes. Okay, good. Mm. So uh, I talked about this curvature, Bayer curvature and the quantum metric, but there is a way to describe this Bayer curvature and quantum metric in a unified. Point. Okay, I have a question uh, from Mohammed. Yes, please. Uh, yes, uh, sorry. And just in your uh, previous slide, uh, you mentioned the far distance uh, is at uh, most is one. So maybe I missed it. What does uh, one means here? So sorry, uh, the one here? Yeah, yeah, no. because that means, yeah, the most, uh, the far distance uh, is one, I guess, yes? According to this relation, if uh, ah. the 
right side equals yes, zero. Yes. That's right. And that's then right. What yes. does it mean basically? So one. Uh, okay. So this inner product can be either uh, can be somewhere between zero and, and one, and so I'm subtracting one. Uh, so in this inner product from one. So this quantity is from zero to one, as you said. But mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's that's right. But this d lambda d lambda is is a small quantity. So so it doesn't really put any constraint on the g itself. So I'm looking at the infinitesimal d. So mm -hmm. it doesn't const uh, like give me any constraint on let's say the range of of metric. Let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you everyone for questions. I'm I'm very happy. So so there's a way to describe this metric and curvature in a unified manner. This is uh, through this can be done through this quantity called the quantum geometric tensor. And so here's the definition of the quantum geometric tensor. So uh, this chi is a quantum geometric tensor. I always I always fix n, so you can maybe ignore this n index here, n is a band index. So what's important is i and j. So i and j gives you the direction in the parameter space. And so this is a local quantity in a, in a parameter space, so it's a function of lambda, and it contains the derivative of quantum states in lambda i and lambda j direction. So this is a kind of thing that we had in the definition of very curvature in the quantum metric. But so here I have inside the derivative, uh, derivative I get this projection to other states. So this uh, kit bra combination is a projection to the n span. Sorry, and I'm subtracting this from one. That means this quantity here is a projection to uh, states other than the, the band that you're looking at. And because we have this projection here, you can show that this quantity, the quantum geometry tensor, is invariant under the gauge transformation. That is, this quantity is uh, invariant you, but, uh, even if you change the definition of psi by certain uh, overall phase factor. Okay, so this is how I defined it, but, but it turns out that the real part of this quantum geometry tensor, the real part of this is nothing but the quantum metric that I introduced in the previous slide. And the imaginary part of this is essentially the curvature times some constants. So this quantum geometry tensor uh, captures both the quantum metric and bare curvature through, real, through its real and imaginary parts. And for example, if the parameter space is two dimensions, that means this i and j takes either one and two, this quantum geometry tensor is a two by two matrix and it takes particular this form. And uh, so something to be noted here is in a diagonal term, there is no imaginary term. So imaginary term is a bare curvature. Uh, but there's only real term, real real part, and that is because you can show that this quantum geometry tensor, the imaginary part of it, is uh, is anti-symmetric with respect to the uh, to the interchange of indices. That means uh, omega one one term is zero, and omega two two is zero. And on the other hand, this real part is symmetric with respect to the interchange. That means g one two is equal to g two one. And so omega one, two is equal to minus omega two, one. So this is the structure that I have. So when the metric is symmetric, bare curvature is anti-symmetric, yes. And so, so far I was uh, looking at, let's say, uh, quantum states in a general parameter space, but now I want to focus on the churn insulator. The churn insulator is, uh, especially two dimensional churn insulators are, our uh, lattice model with bands which are characterized by non zero numbers. So what do I mean by that? What, what I mean by that is let's let's see we start let's say we have we start from a two dimensional lattice model. Sorry, uh, I say models, but it's models. And and from this lattice model we can we can define bulk states and in in uh, momentum space. And here what I mean by bulk states is. Uh, cell periodic part of the of the block state. So I take out the uh, plane wave part and I'm looking at only at the cell periodic part. So so I, I let's say I take a uh, block states and this block states, which is a function of momentum, form a vector bundle over momentum space. Okay, so I'm, I am using some fancy term here, but what's, what's important here is, so this psi of k corresponds to this uh, small psi in, from k in the previous slides. 
And so what, what we have here is, uh, is a map from momentum space to uh, the space of quantum states. And we are going to look at the geometry of this block states and, and its topology. And let me explain a bit more what this, what this map is in a mathematical sense. So if uh, so momentum space of, of lattice model form a, a torus structure, that means, so the Brillouin zone is a torus. So zero and two pi over the uh, lattice distance is usually uh, identified. So we have a torus, and since, since we have two-dimensional model, we have two-dimensional torus. So that is where our momentum k lives in. And then, so for a given value of k, we associate a block state. And block state, for example, for n-band system is uh, given by a vector with n complex numbers. But if one vector, like this is an eigenstate, then multiplying this by an overall uh, arbitrary complex number, uh, which is non-zero, gives you another, another valid eigenstate. So the eigenstates are defined, let's say, up to the overall multiplication of the complex number that, that will give, so we need to identify a different vectors, which are different by an overall multiplication, that will give us the space called the complex projective space. So the block states are, sorry, sorry, the bands are characterized by this uh, map from the momentum space, which is two torus, to a uh, complex projective space with dimension n minus one, complex dimension n minus one for uh, n band system. So, okay, I, I explained this uh, using a little bit mathematical terminology, but what's important for, for the moment is let's say for the first half of the talk is that this block state psi k uh, corresponds to this, this uh, psi in the, on lambda that I was describing before. And churn insulator is an example of topological insulators, which shows the bulk based correspondence. That is, if we have a lattice model with non-zero churn number, so churn number, I, I, I recall you that the churn number is calculated, can be calculated through the integral of the Berry curvature. So this, and if, if the churn number is non-zero, then, then people have found this uh, bulk edge correspondence, which tells you that, that there should be modes which are localized at the edges and the number of modes localized at the edges is equal to the churn number. And that is how this topological property uh, comes into the observable properties of the system. So this is very important in, in the physics of topological insulators, but actually in, in my talk, I will not really talk about this bulk edge correspondence. So you don't need to uh, worry about it talk so much. Well, what I'm going to explore more is this quantum geometric tensor of block states in momentum space. So this is the definition of quantum geometric tensor that I'm rewriting it. But now the parameter space is momentum space where this K is either a, is a two dimensional vector KX and KY. And so this, this Q is a projector to uh, bands other than the one that we're looking at. And since our parameter space is two dimensional now, so i and j uh, takes either x or y, the quantum geometric tensor is a two by two matrix like this. So, okay. And so Berry curvature, I think, in my opinion, is, is rather is famous or popular. And quantum metric, I would say, is less known. And let me explain explain some physical appearances of quantum metric for uh, um, so I want to yes defend the quantum metric for, for its significance. So very roughly speaking, quantum metric is often related to the variance of some parameter operators. For example, you can show that the variance of the position operator of a one-year function is lower bounded by the quantum metric. So I calculate the variance of the one-year function. So one-year function is a localized state, which is constructed from the Fourier transform of the block states. And you can show that this variance is lower bounded by an average of quantum metric over, over momentum space. And so in this way, quantum metric is often related to the variance of certain parameters. And quantum metric in momentum space also is known to appear in uh, current noise spectrum, superfluid density, orbital magnetism, and so on. And, and recently, many, many 
physicists have been exploring physical consequences of this quantum metric. And as, as pointed out earlier in this talk, so in a general parameter space, uh, other than uh, momentum space, quantum metric is equivalent to the quantum future information of pure states, which appears, for example, in the quantum karma rail bound, which uh, tells you the uh, precision of measurement of certain uh, of, of a parameter, and that is related to this quantum metric. Okay. Yes. Uh, question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you define here this uh, your second moment is uh, lower bounded by your metric, and this, this is related with one year state, right? But there That's are right, several yes. uh, freedom to define this one year state. You That's can choose right. different kind of one year state. That's right. You're so, right. And so, so that, that does not matter. Uh, so how? Do ah, okay. So, so, okay, so you can choose uh, different one year states and different one year states have different localization uh, property. Yes. And so this gives you uh, like a lower bound. So the, you, so the left-hand side can change uh, depending on how you choose a one year state, but there, uh, it's always lower bounded by this quantity. I see, okay, okay, thanks. So for example, you can take a maximally localized one year function, still lower bound, bounded by this. So right-hand side is this oh. gauge invariant, left-hand side, Depends on gauge. Here, the gauge means how you construct the one-year states. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And another question, I think. Um, I'm wondering, like, what will happen to the size of the one-year function if the uh, the quantum metric diverges? When the quantum metric diverges, so hmm, quantum metric usually doesn't diverge in a in a sense. Uh, yes, for give for fixed model. But yes, as I said, I think as we, uh, yes, I, I, I understand your, your question. So, so if you change some parameter in the Hamiltonian and, and try to induce topological phase transition or bound gap closing phase transition, and then this quantum metric can diverge and then the left-hand side can also diverge. So the closer the uh, phase, uh, let's say topological phase transition point, the one year function becomes uh, more and more delocalized. And uh, perhaps, you know, in, in churn insulators, one year functions are, cannot, cannot be uh, localized. So yes, uh, even okay. the right hand okay. side diverges, yeah. left hand yeah. side grows. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, if you don't have further questions, I, I will, okay, I have another question. Uh, so I want to ask, guys, so what's the data lambda one? This this quantity here. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, so this is a, uh, not in a context of uh, momentum space, but in a context that, let's say, we, uh, uh, so we have a Hamiltonian which depends on external parameters. And then let's say we do not know the parameter, but we want to exp experimentally determine the parameter somehow. And then you can try to determine this parameter, but there is some uh, limit in the determination of the, uh, in the precision, precision of this parameter. And that is this delta lambda one. And that is lower bounded by the quantum Fisher information or, or the quantum metric. But uh, your quantum metric is got from the, got from the uh, parameter changes, right? So you mean the, yes. the parameter uh, changes is not continuous? Parameter change is not continuous. Uh, parameter change, uh, what, do you, do, what do you mean, sorry? I mean, uh, your quantum matrix, the GY1, it's getting from the parameter change. Yes, that's that right. You, yes. yes, but uh, here it means that um, your, your, this parameter, the, the parameter changes is not, is, uh, not continuous, it's uh, described. Has I don't know what you it's, mean it's by discontinuous. Yes. It's discontinuous because you have a lower band. Ah, okay. So, well, so it's not, it's not uh, the, so, so the left-hand side is uh, like experimental uh, limit in the determining the parameter with certain precision. So it's not, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't mean that I'm quantizing anything. It, 
So you have you have a state which depends on the parameter, and I want to determine this parameter experimentally, and there's some fundamental limit, and that is uh, related to this quantum fusion condition. I not I'm not discretizing anything here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So let me go to the next slide. Yes. Okay. Uh, yes. Before going to yes the relation between quantum metric and topology, I want to introduce another parameter space, which is often important, uh, mainly in the context of many body quantum phases. So I I, I can also define this quantum metric in twist angle space. And uh, that uh, by that, I mean the following. So when considering many body states, it's more natural to consider the geometry and topology of states in the parameter space of twist boundary condition rather than in a K space. And so the twist boundary condition means I assume a periodic boundary condition, but with some phase. And, and I can't parameterize quantum states in terms of this so, so, uh, so uh, yes, in terms of this phase in let's say x and x direction, y direction, and with this x and phase in x and y direction, I can again uh, de define the quantum geometric tensor. So here theta is a twist angle, and and again this is this has a real part and an imaginary part. Real part can be called the many body quantum metric. Imaginary part is the many body bare curvature. And this many body very curvature is known to be related to, for example, uh, many body churn number, which is important in a fractional quantum Hall effect. But you can also consider this many body quantum metric. And so many body quantum metric has certain meanings. And for example, in terms of properly defined position operator, um, this many body quantum metric, for example, in X direction is related to the variance of the position of the state that we're looking at. So, so if you look at, if you define this quantum geometry tensor, the real part tells you that let's say the localization property of your state and the imaginary part tells you topological property of the state and of this many body state. And okay, so this, I, so this quantum, many body quantum metric was defined in or introduced by Soda Wilkerson Martin's paper in 2000. 2000 and, but I, I think not, much uh, research has been done uh, in terms of this 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 quantity, but I think it's it's a uh, it's a very interesting uh, quantity to consider. And I, I'll come back to uh, yes this this quantity later in in, res, in relation to the topology. And okay, so I introduced this quantum metric, and recently there have been some experimental measurements of quantum metric. And as far as I know, the first experimental measurements of any kind of the quantum metric was done in 2019, so three years ago in, in ultra gases, where they tried to estimate the average of the trace of the quantum metric. So it's rather coarse grain, but, but it's related to the quantum metric and in momentum space. So what they did is they, they realized uh, how they model, which is a topological 2D model in ultra gases, and they tried to measure this uh, quantum metric, the average of the quantum metric. Uh, yes, uh, yes, and the measurement is based on, on the theory that was proposed by me in, in 2018. And, but, but later, uh, more, more, uh, more fine measurement of the quantum metric. So momentum resolved the measurement of quantum metric was done in Exton Polarity at this in 2020. And so they, they measured the quantum metric as a function of kx and ky for <clears throat> for for the two band models that they have, and so these are measurements of quantum metric in momentum space. But you can also define quantum metric in a general parameter space other than momentum space, and there have been some progress in experimental measurements of it. And so, for example, the quantum metric of an external parameter space of a two two by two Hamiltonian was measured in Diamond NB Center. Uh, two years ago, and also a similar quantum metric was measured in superconducting qubits and Joseph's junction, and so on. And also, the 
quantum metric was also measured in relation to this quantum fission information and the related quantum quorum row bound was also uh, measured in this paper and uh, what that was published this year. And yes, uh, it's not very important, but the papers that are, are blue are the paper that I'm involved in. Okay, so so far was the introduction to quantum metric. If you don't have questions on the introduction part, I will uh, start discussing these relations between quantum metric and topology. Yes, that I've been investigating these days. So the inequality. So I want to derive an inequality. So I focus on again. So two-dimensional momentum space kx and ky. The quantum metric again. I I, I rewrite it. So the quantum metric and Bayer curvature are loosely related because it is a real part and imaginary part of this quantum geometric tensor. And in fact, I can derive some uh, specific inequality between this real part and the imaginary part through the cauchy schwarz inequality. So note that this Q, the projector inside is a projector. That means Q squared is equal to Q. I, I can use a cauchy schwarz inequality. So this is a cauchy schwarz inequality, which holds for any two vectors uh, where, where uh, inner product is defined. And I, I take, uh, uh, as alpha, I take Q acting on derivative of quantum state in kx direction. And as beta, I take Q acting on derivative in ky direction. And I, I insert this to this cauchy schwarz inequality and doing some manipulation, you can easily show this inequality, <coughs> sorry, that the square root of the determinant of the quantum metric is bigger than or equal to the absolute value of the Bayer curvature divided by two. And this, this inequality was first uh, found, I think by Abra Roy in 2014 in this paper. So this is a, a important inequality that I'm going to explore more. So this inequality gets saturated. That means this inequality becomes equality when this cauchy schwarz inequality saturates and when uh, the cauchy schwarz inequality saturates when this alpha and beta are proportional to each other. That means if there exists some constant number which relates this Q acting on uh, derivative k station and the Q acting derivative ky direction. So when these two quantities are, are proportional, this inequality is saturates. Okay. And I'll explain more uh, meaning of this uh, saturation later. And furthermore, people also like to consider another inequality, which is that the arithmetic mean is always greater than the geometric mean. And it follows that the half of the trace of the quantum metric is greater than the square root of the determinant of, of uh, the quantum metric. Because, okay, left-hand side is the arithmetic mean of the eigenvalues of G, and the right-hand side is the geometric mean of the, the eigenvalues of the G. And so the, this first inequality saturates only when the quantum metric takes this particular form. So it's it's diagonal and the diagonal elements are equal. Only when, only when the quantum metric is of this form, the left inequality gets saturated. <clears throat> yes. Okay, but I want to uh, focus more on the second inequality between the quantum metric and the bare curvature. Yes, yes, a question. Oh, yeah, I, I just want to clarify one thing. So uh, the, the left inequality you mentioned when the, the trace become the determinant. So mm -hmm. that requires the off diagonal component of the G vanishes. So does it mean that very curvature vanishes? Uh, no. So, so, so what I write here is the quantum metric, not the quantum geometric tensor. So very cur uh. curvature can exist. So this is only about the quantum metric part. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, okay, I see, I see. Mm. Okay. Thank you. And the second, the second, uh, second lower component is G Y Y, right? Just to make sure. Oh, this is G X X. So the the this inequality becomes equality only when uh -huh. this one one component and the two two component are the same. Oh, I see. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Yes. Only when these are equal, that is uh -huh. is equal. Yes. Thank you for that. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was a okay. bit confused. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So I want to look at this inequality. 
So this is a local inequality in K, K space. So for each point in K space, this, this holds. Now I want to integrate both sides over momentum space to get something global. And the left-hand side, square root of determinant of G. So if you want, if you in integrate this, okay, so what is the meaning of the square root of determinant of G? This is nothing but the volume form of moment and space measured with respect to quantum metric. That is, so quantum metric uh, puts, uh, defines distance in the parameter space. And with this distance, I can define the volume. Actually, so it's a two-dimensional space, so it's, a, it's an area. So with this quantum metric, I can define area in moment and space. And, and square root of determinant of G gives you this area uh, determined defined from the quantum metric. That is integrating this quantity over momentum space, I get the volume, actually it's an area, of momentum space measured with respect to the quantum metric. So the integral of the left-hand side is a area or the volume of momentum space measured with quantum metric. And I, I, I let, let me call it quantum volume of the momentum space. That's the left-hand side. On the, on the other hand, integrating the right-hand side so integral of the absolute value of the Berry curvature can be related to the turn number because the integral of the absolute value is lower bounded by the absolute value of the integral and the integral of the Berry curvature is related to the turn number. So, or more precisely speaking here is pi times turn number. That means comparing both sides, I get that the quantum volume of momentum space is bigger than or equal to pi times the turn number. I think essentially similar inequality was uh, already found in Raro Roy's paper in 2014. And also uh, Sebastian Piotr and Pai Turma used this inequality to find some uh, lower bound of, of the superfluid weight or super, yeah, superfluid weight in, in a flat, flat term bands. And so that was, yes, uh, that was obtained by integrating this over momentum space. But we can also define the quantum geometric tensor in the twist angle space that I explained a couple of slides ago. And turn number of, uh, for non-interacting fermions, turn number of K space and the twist angle space are the same, but the quantum volume turned out to be different. And you can do the calculation and show that the quantum volume of the twist angle space is bigger than the quantum volume of momentum space and that is bigger than pi times the turn number. Okay. And let's, let's see the con consequence of this inequality. The first, uh, first example that I want to consider is lambda levels. So consider a charged particle in a two-dimensional space with a magnetic field. So I'm taking a lambda gauge, uh, and this is a Hamiltonian of a charged particle in a magnetic field. And then, I, let's say I calculate the quantum metric and Berry curvature and of n lowest levels, and each uh, okay, each level is called lambda level, and do, I can do uh, explicit calculation, and you can show that the quantum metric is diagonal, so gxs and gyy is non-zero, but gxy is zero, and it's equal to n over four pi. Okay, here n, uh, but what I mean by n is I have lambda levels, and I'm taking n lowest lambda levels as as one one entity and I calculate the quantum geometric tensor. I have actually, I haven't defined how to treat multiple bands, uh, multiple bands together, but okay, so there is a way to define quantum geometric tensor and the very curvature for multiple bands together. And if you do this, you can show that if I can include n lowest lambda levels, the quantum metric is proportional to n and it's constant. So it's K independent and constant. And the, Berry curvature is also again constant and it depends on the sign of the magnetic field apply and it's proportional to n. And that and then you can show that the square root of determinant of g is equal. So it's so generally there is an inequality, but for lambda level it's equal to n over 4 pi. And integrating and integrating over the momentum space, I get the global equality that the quantum volumes are equal to the pi times turn number which is pi times n, because each lambda level has a turn number one. So lambda levels are uh, example of energetically and geometrically flat bands. And um, by geometrically flat, I mean geometrical property is, is uniform over momentum space. 
So please, uh, okay, uh, keep in mind that lambda level gives you the example where the inequality is, total, is uh, completely saturated. And then next, let's go to a uh, two band models. So two band models are very special uh, because of the following properties. So for two band models, you can show that the square root of determinant of G is always equal to the very curvature of the two. So you, generally there is an inequality, but for two band models, it's always equal. That means integrating between both sides, quantum volume is equal to pi times the turn number, uh, as long as this very curvature doesn't change sign in momentum space. So that's one nice feature. Another very important property of two band model is for two band models, there always, there must be always points in momentum space where the very curvature becomes zero. So you look at the momentum space, very curvature should become zero at some points in the momentum space for two band models. That means you cannot try to make uh, geometrically flat or uniform bands with two band models because there must be some points where this very curvature drops to zero in, in momentum space. So this is the general property of two band models. And let's take Haldane model as an example, which is a two band model. Here, uh, horizontal axis is a, is a, is a, a on-site mass term in the Haldane model, which is a parameter that, that uh, drives the topological phase transition. On the left-hand side, the churn number is one. On the right-hand side, churn number is zero. And I, I calculate this quantum metric, both in momentum space and the twist angle space. And, and it turns out that uh, quantum volume of the momentum space is, is exactly equal to pi times the churn number in topologically non trivial region because of this this property, that special property. Yes, there's a question. Yeah, yeah. so Professor Ozawa, so can, is there like a topological region in the second property where the bay curvature vanishes at some point? Yes, there is. So, so in, in this paper or maybe in the other paper of mine, uh -huh. uh, we give a proof of this property and it's, it's rather mathematical, but it boils down to this point that two band model, the space of quantum states is uh, CP1, so one dimensional uh -huh. complex product to space, which is isomorphic to uh, uh -huh. S2, so two dimensional sphere. Okay. And uh, so we, what we have here is a map from the two torus to a two sphere. And the fact that these two have different fundamental group, so the first homotopy, group uh -huh. uh, implies or oh, eventually so there's some special if eventually implies that there must be some points where this is zero that okay, means I see. yes so mathematically speaking we cannot construct that uh emergent from the momentum space to this two sphere so that's that's a uh, yes topological reason behind oh, okay oh uh, also another question uh sorry about uh so is so can I understand the inequality between the twist angle? Can you elaborate more about the difference between twist angle space and the mm -hmm. momentum space difference? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. So, so I'm considering here as a twist angle space, a non-interacting fermions. So, so it's like the, just to me, it's the same as the momentum. What's the difference? No, isn't it just same as the momentum? No. Uh, okay, so you, so, okay. Okay, thank you for, for the question. So, okay, yes. So the difference is the momentum space quantum volume is, uh, is given by the integral of the square root of the term of G, right? It's good. And on the other hand, the quantum volume of the twist angle space. So what I have is inside this square root. So in, inside here, G is an yeah. average of momentum space. Uh, so, yeah. so this inequality is essentially telling you that the square root, uh, uh, yes, so it's a square root of the integral is bigger than the integral of the square root. So, so the, so the square root and the integral mm -hmm. enters in different point and there's some cosy schwartz inequality like uh, relation that holds between the twist angle space and the momentum space. Okay, I so, see. Yes. So, okay. There. So is that trace of any uniform that is that the case then? Sorry? So the inequality saturated to yes. when the when G is uniform, so. That's right. Uh, so inequality is uh, saturated when, when uh, the K dependence of GXX, GYY, and GXY are the same. 
So okay. Yes. Yeah. So there's yes, there's some uniformity. Uh, if there's some uniformity uh, in the structure of the momentum space uh, you know, of the yes momentum space quantum matrix, the equality holds. So essentially, yes, this inequality is about about an equality between yes uh, integral of the square root or the yeah. uh, or, or maybe I should say integral of the average and average of the integral. So so there's this uh, yes non commutativity of these two operations. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Okay, so yes, so in a topological non-trivial region, the quantum metric, sorry, the quantum volume turns out to be exactly equal to the true number, and in the topologically trivial region, the quantum metric, or sorry, the quantum volume drops down, and but the fact that this value is less than less than one ensures that and, and this inequality ensures that the churn number should be there because churn number should be below these points and only integer that's below this point is zero. So in both regions here, uh, quantum volume tells about the churn number correctly. So, but here I'm here, it's a two-band model and two-band model is very special. Let me go to a multi-band model. So multi-band models do not have special properties that we solve for two-band models. And let me consider as an example, a hopper Hofstadter model, which is a two-dimensional lattice model with hopping phase. And it's known that when this hopping phase phi takes this, this form one over Q, where Q is an integer, and the lowest band has a turn number of one. And, and it's also known that when Q is large, that means in the low flux limit, the model approaches in some sense to lambda levels. And here I'm plotting this turn number and the quantum volume as, as an increased Q. So as you move toward the right uh, in this horizontal direction, the flux becomes smaller and smaller. And I see that these three quantity, the quantum metric and the quantum volume all converge to the same value. And this is because, okay, so that means as Q becomes large, the inequality tends to saturate. And this is because the system is approaching lambda level and we saw that the lambda levels, this equality holds. So, and also I checked with some other models and it, it seems that if, if we can take a limit uh, of models uh, to become lambda level, this uh, inequality tends to saturate. So the saturation of this inequality, roughly speaking, uh, implies how similar we are going to the lambda level situation. Okay, and in the final part, I want to explain some relation that we found where, with respect to the Kähler geometry. So now it's becoming a bit more, more mathematical and excuse me for that. So now I want to look at this quantum metric as a pullback metric. Okay, what does it mean? So I, I explained previously that the quantum metric is uh, or, the, or the term bands are characterized by the map from the momentum space to complex projective space. And I, run, I remind you that complex projective space is n dimensional vectors identifying different vectors, which are only related, only different by, uh, by overall multiplication of, of a complex number. And this complex project space is, is a manifold. So it's a, yes, it's a, it's a manifold. And it's known that this manifold has a natural metric called the Hubini study metric. So this, comp there is, so there is a, very nicely behaving metric that can be defined on the complex, complex project space. And so here is, is a definition of, of this Houdini study metric for point Z, I, I call it Z in, in a complex project space. The, this Houdini study metric is defined in this way. It looks complicated, but it's, it turns out to be a natural metric to, metric to consider. But now I want to consider the pullback of this metric. So what does it mean? So I have a metric on the complex projective space here, and I want to look at this metric uh, through, uh, through this map from the momentum space. That means I take this Z to be Psi of K. So I have K here and, and I'm 
take this map and this this map will take me to this psyche and put this here and assuming normalized state and you can i can rewrite this uh metric i can rewrite, rewrite metric and you get that this is nothing but the quantum metric so if i look at this we need study metric through this map on the on the moment and space i get the quantum metric and so for this region some people also call the quantum metric a Fubini study metric and this is this is called a pullback metric of of the metric on on the right hand side onto the left hand side so the quantum metric that we've been discussing is a uh, is a metric on the space of quantum states uh, seen on moment and space and we can actually say a bit more about this. So this complex periodic space is, is a special manifold called the Keller manifold. Keller manifold is a complex manifold that is, it locally has, uh, can be spanned by complex coordinates. And then it has a Keller manifold is a complex manifold with these, these uh, three structures. One is a Riemannian structure, which is a metric structure. An example is a Fubini, Fubini study metric we just saw. And there's also a symplectic structure. That means we have a, we have a symplectic form. Okay, so yes, I, I, I'm afraid I can't explain in detail what this means, but so it's a, okay, it's a, it's a two form defined on, on this manifold with certain properties. And these two quantities are related through the complex structure. So I have, a, so this manifold is a complex manifold. So there is a complex structure defining, and there's a rigid relation between these three quantities. And if this happens, it's called Kähler manifold. And so what, why am I telling this to you? So the reason is this complex project space is, is an example of the Kähler manifold with Fubini study metric as a Kähler metric. And also, we can consider this symplectic form on the complex project space. And by considering its, its pullback onto the momentum space, it turns out to be exactly equal okay, up to a factor to the Bayer curvature. That is, that is, that is the quantum geometry tensor, that is the quantum metric and the Bayer curvature that we are discussing so far turns out to be pullback of this scalar structure that was defined, that is naturally defined on the complex project space. And so we can try to understand further this, this uh, implication by adding complex structure to momentum space. So what I'm going to do is the following. So I used to parameterize by momentum space by kx and ky. So momentum, but now I want to parameterize it, it by a complex coordinate Z. There are many ways to introduce complex coordinate on momentum space, but I want to introduce a particular way to introduce Z, which is compatible with the quantum metric. That is, I introduce a quantum, uh, sorry, complex coordinate that, that uh, does not change the metric. So I have a quantum metric defined in momentum space like this. And I try to introduce a complex coordinate which does not change this quantum metric, and we can define in, in a, define it through uh, this way. I first look for the real coordinates. I call it U and V, which satisfies this relation. So, in this coordinates, there's no uh, there's no off-diagonal term in the metric, and and the squared and dv squared have the same coefficient. Such coordinate is called isothermal coordinate, and it's known to exist at this locally in two dimensional space. <laughs> then I, I define the complex coordinate Z by U plus IV. Then in this co complex coordinate, the quantum metric, uh, sorry, the metric is, is invariant. So patching such coordinates together, momentum space now has a structure of complex manifold, which is also called the Riemann surface. So okay, now it's becoming rather complicated, but what we've done is the following. So we, so, where we started is this map that characterizes the band. So from the momentum space to the complex projective space. And on the right-hand side, we had this complex manifold structure and the Kähler structure. Now what I want to do is also on the left-hand side, I want to introduce a complex structure. So I want to look at both sides as complex manifolds. And then I want to look at this map as a map between two complex manifolds. And so 
the reason why I want to do this is the following. So on the right hand side, we had this metric and the Keller form, which, uh, which satisfy this relation. So the right hand side was, has this Keller structure. And by pulling back, by pulling back this metric and the two form to the momentum space, we had this quantum metric and the bare curvature. So we can expect that also maybe on the left hand side on the momentum space, we have this Keller manifold structure. But it turns out that this is not always the case in the following sense. So on right hand side, complex product space was a Keller manifold with this Keller uh, metric and the two form, but the momentum space is not the Keller manifold with the quantum metric and the very curvature as the metric and the symplectic form. Because if we take quantum metric as a Keller metric, we can show that the associated Keller form, the two form, is a square root of determinant, determinant of G. That means, okay. When this square root of the determinant of G is equal to the bare curvature divided by two, so when this equality holds, the Keller manifold structure on the right hand side is exactly inherited uh, to the Keller manifold structure on or, or, the, or the structure on the momentum space. But this equality is exactly what we've been uh, looking at so generally there is an inequality okay so there's a there was absolute value but okay apart from this absolute value generally there's an inequality but when this equality holds the Keller manifold structure on the right hand side is exactly uh, inherited on the momentum space and let me yes uh let me elaborate uh, on this uh, saturation of this inequality a little bit. So the saturation of the inequality is related to the map being a holomorphic map in the following sense. So we can show that this map is a holomorphic map when this uh, this map, uh, so, so, the, so the map, the, sorry, the derivative of the Z bar, the, so Z, Z bar is a complex conjugate of Z, it, uh, acted with Q is equal to zero. You, know, you may say that the map is holomorphic when you when the derivative with respect to Z bar is zero, but I, I need to add Q here because, okay, right hand side has a, this uh, as a uh, projective space structure that we identify different states by, by uh, different states, which are different by a uh, overall factor. So that's kind of taken care of by this Q factor here. But anyway, so if you admit that this is a condition of this map being holomorphic, then you can write this derivative with respect to Z bar in terms of the derivative in Kx and Ky. And then you put, put this in here, you, you see that this uh, condition is equal to the, this condition here, that the Q acting on uh, derivative in Kx direction is the proportional to Q acting on derivative in Ky direction. And this was nothing but the condition for the saturation of the cosy Schwartz inequality that we saw before. And we can show that we can show that this map being holomorphic gives a necessary and sufficient condition for the equality. So we can show that these three conditions are equivalent. The inequality saturates, so this inequality saturates, and the map is a holomorphic, holomorphic map, or more precisely it's holomorphic emergent. And the more momentum space is a Kähler manifold with structure inherited from Complex, pro complex projective space. And so we, we said in this paper, uh, we, we defined the Kähler band to be bands which satisfy these conditions. But I, I think in some literatures, this is also called uh, ideal term band or something. I, I think, yes, uh, it's, it's related to what people often call ideal term bands. And we can also define flat Keller band to be a geometrically uniform uh, flat uh, uniform band where this is equal to some constant over the momentum space. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So what? Okay. So what's what? What is what is this good for? Okay. So let me explain some uh, reason that this can be useful. So first, first I need to note that the lambda levels are example of completely flat. Keller band. So it's a uh, lambda levels are completely geometrically uniform, and also this inequality saturates. 
You can also show that it's not possible to construct completely flat killer bands with models with a finite number of bands. Lambda labels had infinite number of bands, so we can we can have completely flat band with a saturation in open quality, but with finite bands, it's not possible. But we can still try to construct uh, the killer bands, that is that the bands which, uh, which uh, saturate this inequality, which are almost flat. And so this is a procedure we gave in, in this paper, which is, okay, sorry, rather technical, but so there is some parameter P that appears in this construction. And we, we can show uh, more or less rigorously that as P becomes large, the Berry curvature becomes flatter and flatter. So P is equal to two here, four equals four here, six here. This becomes flatter and flatter. So we get we get geometrically flat bands as, as we increase increases P. And generally speaking, this construction gives rise to infinite range hoppings, but we can truncate the hopping up to nearest neighbor. And this does not, it turns out that this does not really make the bands uh, more dispersive. So we can. With, this, with, with the truncation, we can still expect quite a flat bands for, for large enough, uh, this uh, parameter P. So, okay, here's a summary. And so geometrical property of churn insulators are characterized by the quantum geometric tensor, whose real part is a quantum metric and the imagined part is a very curvature. And there's this inequality. And by integrating this, we get a global inequality and the saturation of this inequality is related to the Kähler manifold structure of momentum space, and um, which is related to the holomorphic uh, conditions. And using some properties of holomorphic functions, we can try to construct geometrically flat bands obeying this, uh, obeying uh, the equality here. And so, um, so the talk today is based on this, this paper that we published with Bruno Mera, who is, who is now in Tohoku University in my group. And so if you're interested, you can check this out. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Rosava, for this interesting uh, talk. Let us thank our speaker. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and we have uh, time for questions. Uh, uh, can I ask one question? Yeah, go uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I, I cannot find how to raise my hands. So, um, anyway, uh, I am wondering what this quantum volume means. I mean, is there any physical meaning or implication to it? Or is it just general way to define volume when when metric is non-zero? So that's a good question. I don't have a good answer to this in the sense there's no, let's say like a physically observable quantity which directly relates to quantum volume. Quantum volume is, is a, like volume calculated with quantum metric. So it's, in a sense, it's natural given the quantum metric, but physically, okay. Yeah, physical meaning it's, it's hard to answer. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. So I, I have a question. So, yes. uh, so land, uh, you gave the, this nice example of the lambda level, which is this yes. curvature become uniform and things yes, like yes, that. Yes, but, yes. This, but it is not the, it is the stronger condition than the, this equality hold, it looks like. So is there any other physical examples that you can think of or physical situation that this equality hold so other okay. than lambda level, yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so for two band model, equality huh. always holds. So it's it's an it's an example, for example. Uh, yeah. Yes, and for multi band models, generally the it's I don't know any particular model which huh. which the equality inequality is equality, uh -huh. but uh, yeah, other than two band model and lambda level, I don't know any particular model or let's say particular natural, we can consider a natural model, but I don't know any other particular situation that the equality saturates, uh, inequality saturates. Okay. Uh, doesn't it usually require some like a uh, long range hoping, no? This inequality in the multiband model? Mm. 
because you don't want the uh, like uh, some complicated k dependence, which naturally means the some long range hoping in real space picture probably. Uh, okay, you you may be right. I can't answer it, uh, but you may be right. I don't have any good uh, argument for or against it, but I think your intuition has some uh, correctness, I think. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience? It seems not. So in this case, uh, let us thank Professor Rosava again. Thank you. And uh, with this, uh, we 